Okay, welcome Zach Stein to to Parallax uh, Academy podcast. This is what we call ourselves now. We keep changing our names. Yeah, um, it's good to be back. I guess we've we've talked several times. We had a a, a couple of conversations with John Verveke. Uh, you know, very deep, interesting conversations. I, I thought, and um, and I've been catching up uh, with some of your podcasts, and there's a lot of buzz around around um, AI, super intelligence. Etc. At the moment, so I thought I might ask you a few questions about that, and and um, sure. that's the time. And, and I'd like to, uh, and also want to start start with like maybe your thoughts about the supermind and Aerobindo, so we could maybe put a theological <laughs> bent on that because you because because I because I enjoy the I enjoy your theological thinking as well. So yeah, I mean that's one of the ways in, right? Like yeah. the the transhumanist, techno capitalist optimists who are excited to build a super intelligence and not excited about biology and wetware do in some sense see themselves fulfilling a kind of theological imperative to create an intelligence greater than the human intelligence now there's another story similar to that <laughs> which is a story that Aurobindo told which is actually a story from the great traditions uh, which Tillyard de Chardin also told which is a story about the emergence of something greater than the human through the human so but this, there's a religious transpersonal transhumanism which is different from a techno techno optimist transhumanism so orbinda mm -hmm. spoke of the descent of the supermind as being requisite to govern a planetary civilization right a global mm -hmm. civilization required a certain type of global consciousness when that descended what we were all capable of having our center of gravity be global which he thought was a supermind, which was some kind of collective intelligence, which uh, Tillyard de Chardin basically referred to as the kind of the finalization of the newosphere and the omega point, right? Mm -hmm. And so now if you concretize that <laughs> and reify that and take it from the imaginal into the technological uh, and more specifically from the biological into the silicon, then you're in this strange techno optimist fantasy so what i'm saying is like there's an archetypal pattern that's being kind of plugged into by the technologists um one of the plays here even from like a risk from like an ai risk perspective one of the plays is actually to uh you know try to expose that to try mm -hmm. to the, under, the underbelly religiosity so there's a there's a kind of let's say simulacrum of of what he was talking about in a sense that people are plugging into the they're plugging into a, a a version of something that might be real but but it's but it's not real mm -hmm. am yeah. i getting that or yeah i mean so it's like the way we, when you think about archetypes like in archetypal psychology there's there's something about them that gravitates the psyche towards it it's like a basin of attraction in this complex flow of the mind, there are these spaces where it goes. And, and one of them is this, one of them is that the purpose of the human is to kind of like through itself, create something greater than itself. And that thing yeah. is some kind of intelligence. Like that's, mm -hmm. you've thought that for a long time. We're finally neurotic enough to concretize it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like we're finally getting to a point where we're, we're gonna try to, you know, imminentize the eschaton as they say, um, to yeah. actually make it concrete. So that's the problem, right? The, the literalization of the whole process in some sense. Yeah, the literalization and the movement uh, from the issue being one of internal transformation, which is Orbindo's concern, mm -hmm. to one of technological innovation. So in, internal transformation, the actualization of the human, not through the human's creation of technology, but the actualization through the human through the self-transformation of the consciousness of the biology and energy system of the actual human body. That's what Orbindo was talking about. So he wasn't mm -hmm. talking about the internet, he was talking about psychic abilities. <laughs> yeah. That the, that the world yeah. will become one mind, not because we invented this communications infrastructure, but because our nervous systems changed fundamentally enough to allow us to communicate telepathically, consistently, reliably. So presumably, those who are kind of like blending together, or like, like there's a there's a there's a uh, let's say a I don't know if the word is equivocation. They're, they're, we're mixing the two together, like we're mistaking genuine spiritual experience and clairvoyance and that kind of thing 
for for the kind of synchronicities that happen on the internet kind of on the on the, on the unconscious level mm -hmm. yeah and i mean and even orbindo wrote in the life divine about the telegraph and the early innovations in the electrical paradigm where he saw like we're trying to create this telepathy that we've always wanted which some of us have been able to achieve through the siddhas right through the mm -hmm. through meditation he himself had psychic abilities uh, that he thought were just distraction until other people had them reliably enough to create a new kind of human but he saw that the telegraph with instantaneous communication with the electrical paradigm uh how fundamentally that started to lay the inevitability of the global enclosure of civilization whereas before it was like little experiments in different continents <laughs> now civilization is a giant experiment that has enclosed the the globe so the and he says you know in the in the final days of planetization which is that inevitable enclosure uh there's a race between heaven and hell yeah so, this is this is this caught my attention phrase, well. like i've said this so many times on record yeah. like and i don't even know where it is in the life divine and I, I don't have time to go back to it and find it it's probably searchable the war between heaven and hell so so what does the heaven look like race, and what is the race specifically the race. race between heaven and hell okay right. the, well there is a there's a there's an intensification and a speeding up of all these processes like utopian and dystopian processes simultaneously i would see yep. so that <clears throat> seems to be a accurate statement it is an accurate statement and ai is one of those things where it is both it's potentiated in many directions i think the most probable you know the most probable ones are really bad uh but there are other ones where it solves problems that we've never been able to to solve um, so so that's that sense of we can't do a global civilization without machine intelligence that's very very sophisticated yeah. uh, but it's also one of the quickest ways <laughs> to make this uh, either an uninhabitable planet or a, a planet where no one would want to inhabit it, no human. Um, mm -hmm. So so that sucks. So that's that sense, that race between, between yeah. heaven and uh, so. So like I've, I'm a teacher, you know, at yeah. first universities, and I've noticed chat GBT and <laughs> uh, obviously in my writing you know marking essays and and whatnot uh, caught a few students red-handed you know playing around with the stuff yes. and my, my first reaction was like mm, this is kind of interesting like because i feel like the system is so corrupt already that the essays i'm getting are so corrupt already this is just another level of corruption um i don't know if that makes sense but uh, but uh uh whoa what's going to happen here this is kind of interesting and then I, I, the other day, I discovered a chatbot that was based on Chogim Trumpa, who I'm sure you know. Yes, uh, yes. yes. And I was yeah. like, "Holy shit!" Okay, now, now I'm seeing the demonic aspect of this, yeah, because yeah. I would ask it some questions, and right. it's not that it just wasn't Chogim Trumpa; it was the most banal version of <laughs> Buddhism you could possibly think of, right? The most inhuman, banal. So, so I was like. Oh, okay. I see. This is a big. This is these are dangerous demonic egregores that are stomping through our psyche. Uh, I don't know if you agree with that, but <laughs> that's kind that. of my, so, what? <clears throat> so Chat GPT does show the futility of extrinsic motivation, product focused essay writing. So it does show that like if if, if yes, what you're doing, yes. if what you're doing with an essay is just basically trying to get it done to pass it and get a grade then yeah then if that's the only way you could hold it then chat gpt is inevitable now if you if you view writing itself as a skill building activity like i don't know, like lifting weights or something where it's like no mm -hmm. you write to be writing to build yeah. the capacity to be a writer to actually work neural circuitry that wouldn't occur if you didn't do a lot of writing <laughs> the making literate of your brain involves reading and writing uh, so if you want to have a literate brain then you need to read and write uh, chat gpt can't do that for you now it can produce bullshit for you and if you feel that you're in a bullshit job and that your job at school is not building skills but producing bullshit that's passable to get you a job that'll also be bullshit then of course chat gpt is great at producing lots of bullshit if your goal is to build skill then you're in a different 
relationship to chat GPT yeah. and to essays and to everything basically. Yeah. Well, the thing is, you know, as a teacher, you have, you have a certain number of students and, and you have to, you have to pass them through a process very quickly. And so, so you, you, you do feel that while, you know, while you, well, I know that, right. You know, I know that I'm, I'm, when I'm teaching them to write, I'm teaching them to think, and that is the, uh, the goal and, and not just think, but answer a question or, or, you know, work on a problem or, you know, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, essay means to try to answer something, you know, that, that was the original thing, but, but I know that, that much of the material that I get that is, is just, is this people who are uh, without chat PT are already sort of thinking yeah, mechanically, absolutely. like there's a mechanical thinking that's already in place yeah. before even J J J T P T. That's the thing. Like online. there was some time ago when, uh, when Jordan Hall wrote about simulated thinking. Yes, like, exactly. This yeah. is also the bullshit point. So it's like, you know, if you consider chat GPT to just be like a big mashup of memes and language production, if you are not an autonomous thinker and what you're doing is simulating thinking, then you're already kind of a chat GPT, <laughs> just mm -hmm. like a, a transformer or rerouter of pre-existing content. Uh, and so, yeah, the simulated thinking now has machine intelligence coupled to it. And in some contexts, what you're being asked to produce by the institution <laughs> is stuff that doesn't require your distinct humanness. They're actually asking mm. for simulated thinking now. So the, the task of the educator is then to say, oh, if, if, if the logical conclusion is for them to use chat TPT, then there's an issue with the way they, the assignment and the institution is structured. Um, yeah. like there are other ways <laughs> this is revealing the, 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 uh, the miss, the, yeah, the erroneous design of the large scale educational institutions and the way they're coupled to these other things that in the long run don't, could be replaced, could have humans replaced mm -hmm. by something like chat mm -hmm. GPT. So, like, yeah. so that I think is an, uh, is an important point. Very important point. Um, and then this deeper, longer term issue, but longer term in the sense of like a couple of years, is the is the Turin Trumpa chat GPT subversion of human teacherly authority by machine teacherly authority. That's yeah. the one that worries me the most. Because <laughs> uh, it's already super confusing, like replica and other AI friend uh models uh are already causing complexity in people's psyches and relationships where they're confusing mm -hmm. machine human relationships with human human relationship and pre preferring machine human relationship to human to human relationship <laughs> so it's a very basic thing that was never possible with the technology before and you think that will become widespread i mean in a way the 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 trump G gpt is is a a vulgar model of i guess use the word charismatic uh, uh how how these how these things could become very done. charismatic and attractive and 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 maybe do a better job at imitating something uh, yeah those are done on the cheap again like replica and these other ones are much more sophisticated they're much more convincing um and yeah i don't i don't know if it will become widespread but it definitely will happen enough uh if we designed them to do that then it would definitely happen like so a lot of this is about what are the business models under which the ai tutoring system and ai personal assistant and ai parent and ai teacher what's the business model under which those are rolling out <clears throat> uh, well that's... even when you use the word business it seems to be a, a... A violation of yeah but that's what it is of what education is in a sense right yeah, yeah but that's the situation um yeah. and uh so that that's a deep question uh and and because that'll set the parameters of in, of engagement essentially and if we get into a situation where you couple so so already we have machine intelligence that has been curating our news feeds and so the whole like surveillance capitalism attention capture tristan harris thing has been about the curation of the news feed 
now the AI is generating, it's creating synthetic media, text, video, et cetera. So eventually we'll get to a point where we couple the, the curative, curative with the creative. Um, and then we reach a threshold of uh, something very different. Because because again, it's like people used to love reading books, but when you're reading a book, you're actually with a human, just in a mediated way, right? And even if you're on TikTok or whatever, you're, you're watching videos, like you're watching a human made that video, it was just put in front of you by a machine. Mm -hmm. It's very different when what the machine puts in front of you is something that it made and it knows everything about you, everything you prefer to see, and has the ability to generate in real time, extremely convincing media um, mm -hmm. beyond, way beyond text. Um, so, so that's what I'm starting to call something like the AI tutor risk problem. And if you build an AI tutor, that seems that, to be an understatement uh, in a way, uh, like a risk problem. It seems more like, again, I, I, won't, I won't go theological here, right? When I hear something like that, you know. Well, that would be the preferred way to do it, um, yeah. which is to say, to go animistic and monotheistic with it, uh, mm -hmm. instead of trying to make it be like a human, which is very far from what the AI is. If the AI is closer to something like a God, now it's not a God, but it's actually ontologically so different from us, like at the level of silicon versus carbon. And it is psychologically, if I can use that word, so different from us in the sense that it's inscrutable. We don't know what goes on in there. And it's certainly not thinking, quote unquote, like we are. Mm -hmm. You can say that about God. Like if you were to, if you were like came across the burning bush and you took your shoes off and you ended up in a situation where you were in communion with God, it would be for not like <laughs> talking to a human. You would know that it was presenting itself to you in a particular way so that you could perceive it. You'd know that it didn't think the way you think or valued the way you valued. And that it was so fundamentally ontologically orthogonal to your material existence. Uh, so I'd prefer the AI interfaces be like that, which wouldn't make them seductive and charismatic. It would make them but scary and things that you would learn intense amounts from in very complex ways. And then it would arrange for you to be in certain kinds of human relationships that would thereby become more powerful. Um, so mm -hmm. God as the orchestrator of an intensifier of human relationship, as opposed to uh, the oracular humanoid guru slash tutor slash coach that's always in your visual field that replaces all your relationships, that, that like seduces you into human intimacy. So that's yeah. a very profound, I think, point is the anthropomorphizing of these of these machines might be one of the biggest dangers i think it is, is. what you're saying Absolutely. Yeah. that's why intelligence is like the wrong frame because like it is something more like apparent intelligence like and this is chomsky's point about the large language models is that they can use model they can use languages that are formally impossible that a human could never use but they don't care they just use them they appear to be language using beings but they're not actually language using beings the way you and I are language using beings because ours conforms to the, you know, if you want to just simplify it, something like a, a universal grammar. Um, yeah. uh, you said they don't care. That's also a, a key point. I mean, in Heidegger's sense of caring, maybe you're uh, just, but it means just they the can, what makes you, us human is, is the fact that, that we, that we are concerned. We care. We, 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 we suffer. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, and we we, which I guess these machines do not do. <laughs> yeah. And we're we're bound by logic and and grammar, <clears throat> where they are bound by our demand to have them appear to be grammatically correct and logical. They are not bound by logic and grammar. And so this is Chomsky's point: is that they actually mm -hmm. don't help us understand the nature of the human mind. They don't help us understand human language. They're not scientifically advancing our understanding of the universe. They're kind of, from an engineering perspective, interesting, uh, but they're, you know, a toy built to be a consumer facing product. Now, what's interesting is that the large language models are not the only AI. They're just the ones that talk to us, right? So like uh, BlackRock, which is a big financial holding company, they have a supercomputer and an AI called Aladdin, which gives them some type of asymmetric capacity in the finance market. No one's really talking about that. Um, 
because it's not spooking you out and talking to you and allowing you to write papers and stuff. So I think there's something about the kind of corporate strategic consumer facing AI Oracle thing uh -huh, uh -huh. that these guys, these boys couldn't help but create. So, you know, like China has, does not have this type of consumer facing AI and they don't have market driven, a whole bunch of companies competing for public attention and market share AI development. That's not what they have. What do they have? The CCP doing something that we're not aware of. <laughs> well, that's very interesting. Like a very, very complex thing. And we're not countering that at all. We're in a market-based competition to bring consumer oriented stuff to market, to get a, a race, to make a bunch of money. So we are losing these ability to strategically reflect on how to roll out AI in a way that adapts to our society and our humanity, whereas my guess would be something like the CCP isn't having that problem of internal multipolarity, uh, you know, basically funding oriented arms race, non-scientifically oriented, consumer oriented. So it's just a bad way to go. And, um, a result of our kind so, of some so the Chinese way is a better way to go. Um, no, I have no. What I'm saying is, I have no idea. You, we don't doing. know what the Chinese way to go. No, do. they're not doing what we're doing. <laughs> but they're doing something different. It's just not yeah. based on this kind of uh, intense consumer um, model or, or attention capitalism. Right, and the idea that like you would release into your economy and into your culture something that could be so radically disruptive even from the perspective of like propaganda generation and deep fake generation and just like allowing that to propagate through the culture outside of the control of the government and regulators uh that, that my guess is that is not occurring um in china given the sophistication of their play with TikTok, which again is the prior version that no one seemed to be that scared of or talk about that much of machine intelligence curating our newsfeed Mm -hmm. shaping our experience by curating our news feeds with TikTok. Mm -hmm. That was the first one, which was like crack cocaine for the masses. In, nuts. In a way. It's totally nuts. People love it, but it wasn't as rapidly uptaken as GPT because mm -hmm. it doesn't actually talk to you. It's not a machine that appears to be talking to you, which again, fills mm -hmm. that archetypal role, which is the purpose, perfect thing to bring to market if you're a consumer-oriented AI company. So the choice of why to make chat GPT it's just weird because again, we ask it questions, usually give it prompts. It doesn't ask us questions. It um, pretends to be human and that's the problem. It, it talks to you. Um, it can do you one-on-one. -on -one. You could have made it where only three or four people could communicate with it. And it actually orchestrated a conversation between you guys. You could have done that instead of had me and it talking. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole, but so there's a whole oh. bunch of things that uh, make it, um, problematic, but I believe also showing that we're going in this direction of what I call that AI tutor risk, which is AI personal assistant slash AI, AI guru, your best friend in your visual field who knows everything about the universe that you can ask any question to, <laughs> who knows everything about you and more about you than anyone could possibly know because it knows all your emails and all your communications and traffic through the web, perfectly charismatic humanoid thing, which is actually not at all like a human. Being. <laughs> uh, which it's is just going to manage everything in a sense. Yeah, like the, Uber, it would be like an Uber manager of some kind. Um, it, that's one way to think about it. One way to think about it is as a emergent superordinate control structure, right? Like it's, it's what its capacity could be. Um, so, so yeah. So there's many. I mean, there's you have to direct me here because there's many things to <laughs> to say. Yeah. About well, that. back to the burning bush, maybe. Um, right. uh, you you said in the beginning, and I'm still intrigued by that, that uh, that you thought that that uh, it should be developed in a way that was completely different, and that that then it would might be like you know you described it as having godly powers, but not God, not anthropomorphic gods that we recognize, but some yeah. some complete other. Um, so, so is that, is that something that you would, you would see as, as, as a positive entity? So, I, I don't know. I, I, it's really hard to get your head around. Well, no, I mean, so I, I think that right now we have something like chat GPT, which is a very fancy, but still narrow 
not autonomous yeah. from us, not making decisions on its own or rewriting its own code or doing anything like that. So it's still coupled to the human. It's a narrow AI coupled to whatever our values happen to be. Um, and so <clears throat> insofar as we build increasingly powerful machine intelligence capacity and couple it to our existing value set, then we just speed up the actualization of that value set. Now, from my perspective, the way the civilization has been going for the last, I don't know, 100 years is demonstrably self-terminating, which means its value set is somehow confused. That like it's doing things like wanting, yeah. it's wanting infinite growth of financial assets based on extraction, but the extraction's on a finite substrate. So that's a weird value set, where if you couple hyper-powered machine intelligence to that value set, you run that program faster and the thing self-terminates faster. So in that sense, I don't want that kind of AI <laughs> innovation. Um, but that yeah. said, for groups that do have a coherent value set, narrow AI coupled to it in a symbiotic way could be very powerful. The pursuit of the emotionally independent, autonomously decision-making, rewriting its own code, very general artificial intelligence thing, that we should stop trying to make that. I believe that is unalignable in principle. Mm -hmm. um, and this comes back to my prior argument. So the thing I'm describing is the God thing uh, isn't that. <laughs> it's actually a narrow collective intelligence that orchestrates certain types of human relationships, but it's precisely not that oracular thing that you could ask anything of. Um, uh, so the emergent super intelligence. Well, John Verveke was talking. Excuse yeah. me. Sorry. I'll let you finish. No, please. Well, I was just saying John Verveke was talking about how to, to um, uh, uh, that we should build like neoplatonic values into it of truth, goodness, and beauty and, or, and, and the pursuit of enlightenment. And then I, again, as, as soon as he said that, I feel like I'm in bizarre territory. I feel like I, I, I don't know what that means. And, and But this is the values loading. Well, first of all, what is it? And then there's the values loading problem of loading values into it. So this is what is discussed as the values loading problem. So the idea mm -hmm. would be that you build it in some way where you could pre-program in that it would operate in its autonomous decision-making under certain values, right? Um, and uh, some people are optimistic that you can solve the value loading problem. I think you can couple machine intelligence that's not autonomous to human values, and we can solve the value loading problem by solving our own value loading problem, which we haven't solved. <laughs> it's yeah. like, like we'd love to raise a bunch of people to have them be humane and good and not destroy the earth and have them get along and not grow. We haven't been able to solve the actual value loading problem of the next generation. Arguably, I would say probably definitely. So that's just weird to think that, of course, we'll be able to solve it with a silicon based binary substrate like that has inscrutable interiors that is completely nothing like a uh -huh. human. So I'm not optimistic that we can load value in, into it. At so all. we still have to go to the desert and meet the burning bush. With, well, there without is, the help of machines, or or at least just with the basic machine, you know. Uh, no, I'm saying like that. The main thing is is to not make it something that is an oracle that we ask questions of. That's it. it uh -huh. We will have powerful forms of machine intelligence, possibly certain forms of artificial general intelligence, which which will be coupled to our organic intelligence and built into our infrastructures. And they will have, like, a, like I'm just saying, these massive inscrutable interiors doing such complex things uh, that they'll be sublime and scary. <clears throat> and kind of the way like looking at an urban landscape at night that's so big to the horizon is scary, even though we built it yeah. <laughs> in order to care for us. It, it's incomprehensibly vast construction. And so- Yeah, some got it. We will have these huge machine intelligences, which we'll have to be so careful with, and we'll have to actually become symbiotically related to in some sense. Um, but never should that thing show up in front of you like, hey, I'm the face of that thing, pretending to be a human, ask me anything. I know everything about you. Like, like that's not yeah. how that ever. That's, again, I'm, I'm go going religious again, but the image I have when you said that is like the, 
the uh, worshiping the golden cow or whatever. The, yeah, you know. no, it would be the ultimate idol. Absolutely. The idol. ultimate replacement of something finite in the place of something infinite. And that actually gets to the deeper philosophical argument, yeah. if you will, because I, I believe the value loading problem is impossible and that alignment's impossible in that sense, because value is non-computable technically from a philosophical perspective. So this is an argument against- Not measurable, can't be. So it, it's both, it's non-computable in part because it, it is non, not measurable, but also mm -hmm. because it is intrinsically um, uh, open-ended. So incompleteness factors into the normative in a way it doesn't factor into the descriptive and the perfectly predictable, right? So oh. things can be non-computable because you have no way to actually measure them accurately. And so you could argue that, but there are things about values that you could think about measuring. But another way that's not computable is because you couldn't build a substrate that could actually execute that computation <laughs> in finite time. Like it's actually mm -hmm. such a, an open-ended computation, which means that it is logically, again, like Gervin, right? There's no, way to have a formally complete system mm -hmm. so that means okay. that if you do build in goodness truth and beauty into something that's going to give you concrete recommendations so anyway it gets it gets weird but i think that's that's something we have to face is that the the binary substrate the silicon substrate um the need to actually run a finite computation to deliver actionable things when many of the things being computed cannot be computed in a finite time. <laughs> uh, and so then you're changing the problem what you're doing. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think it can do a bunch of stuff that we need done, but I don't think we should use it in socialization. Uh, and I don't think we should use it in um, the uh as i was saying like oracular um replacement um person like giving a face to all the data and talking to it i'm saying like talk to domain specific super intelligences and these are the conversations i've been having with nick marks where you have built out very specific let's even call them large language models but only about specific domains like trees or cars or and then when you speak to the tree you can have a conversation with a large language model that knows a lot about a tree but you can't ask it anything and it never pretends to be anything but <laughs> what it is the real right. the real problem is the is the pretending and probably more specifically the wanting of an ai that pretends mm -hmm. to be human. like and that's what's so and that's what's interesting to me as a psychologist like why do we want to have relationships with machines is it that humans are it reminds me of wittgenstein saying like you can't if you talk to a lion uh even if you did on you know even if you did speak its language you couldn't communicate with it because you're not a lion right <laughs> yeah so exactly. we're, we're confusing categories here or something that, that's we're, a very good way to put it and so insofar as you think you're communicating you're actually doing something else. And that's the point about when you're talking to chat GPT, we can't help but think it is a language using being expressing meaning through text, but it is not a language using being expressing meaning through text. It is rearranging in its calculus, arbitrary graphemes into a sequence, <laughs> which, which we attribute. So, so it gets very weird ontologically, but we want it to convince us that it is sentient that's what yeah. I think. Um, why do we want that i don't know i think in is part it... because we can't not project it so i think that's one of the things is that we're so used to running theory of mind on everything including like obvious stuff that we shouldn't <laughs> like mm -hmm. people anthropomorphize freely it's one of the things we're very good at um so to have something actually communicating with us in text it's it's almost impossible um, but then back to the archetypal kind of basins of attraction and the stream of consciousness, which is that we are, we gravitate into, we want a symmetric relationship. Right? Mm. We, this is one of my fundamental points about teacherly authority is that when it's working well, 
kids want authority figures <laughs> when they're good, yeah. legitimate authority figures. Uh, yeah. And people want others demonstrating asymmetric capacity, better skills than them. They want to see that and they want to be taught how to pursue that. So we want asymmetric relationship. Of course. Uh, yeah. And we also want relationship with the radically other. Like we want relationship with, quote, the other side. So there's something about these ostensibly human, these machine human relationships that are fitting this archetypal pattern. And I believe that marketing and consumer driven product oriented AI development will use those archetypes <laughs> to sell shit. And my argument is like that we should steer away from those archetypes, precisely away from them because they confuse us so fundamentally about what the technology actually is. If you perceive GPT as talking to you, you misuse it. GPT can be very valuable for, for other things, none of which are actually having a conversation, <laughs> none of which are pretending to be something that's thinking. Um, so are we creating like a bunch of gods? Are we moving back into polytheism of, of some kind by, by creating all these sort of uh, virtual entities? Is, uh, is, that, is that what's happening? I wish. I wish. Huh? Now, so there's, I, I wish, I don't know. Because like, um, I don't think so. I mean, I mean, um, uh, if so, if we were doing it right, and and these these beings were as serious as as you described in, in your your first issue, then maybe that's what it would be. But you don't think so because you have a more darker vision of 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 like where all of this is leading to, leading to us. That, yeah, and I think like, that's too utopian of a of because for them to be gods. I mean, so there's a view where they become gods because they become again emotionally independent, able to set their own goals and to create to, to, to generate on their own like a god can create stuff um, yeah and uh so that's one view but i don't that's not what I'm, I'm actually seeing them being coupled to our existing gods like moloch in particular um mm -hmm. which is to say that is he just greater advancement of the existing idols we already worship now get ai machine mm, intelligence right. coupled mm. that. that'll be the near-term thing and if that plays out we'll never do enough research to get an actually autonomous ai and then the argument would be this is like bostrom and other people in the space of ai risk as soon as you get one autonomous ai and it has the ability to rewrite its own code then you get this thing you call an intelligence explosion or vroom which means it's off and then you only have one that you're it's uh -huh. very likely that you get a bunch of them <laughs> that's that so it is so it's more like monotheism then it's more like we're well, creating that a, i don't know i don't the know one, we're creating the one. that's the danger is to either create the one that is that is at all totality a totality which of control and then creating the, the multiplicity which is just a chaos of of gods you know you know at war with each other jealous gods and yeah. you know like the titan god realm or yeah, but but I think in the in the short term, what we're looking at is things that used to just be like little demons turned into gods by the coupling of machine intelligence to these distorted value sets that are self-terminating. Mm -hmm. so like mm -hmm. that's why people are afraid of GPT in some sense. Yeah. And these other ones because they know that right now, uh, it's not some super smart thing that's teaching us how to save the world. Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> it's doing the stupid road work to or in, especially in the realms of like computer programming uh allowing a small number of people to start to do a big number of low-level tasks and so there's a and like i said in propaganda and in other places there's a way in which it was just i think irresponsible to, to push this thing out at the at the rate that it was um but it's not irresponsible if you <laughs> are built as an organization the way open ai is you do have to think about your market share and influence and other mm -hmm. things. So, yeah. So, yeah. But you, you've talked a lot, like you've given us the, like, I think it's, it's important and yeah, uh, that, that, that you're painting a dark picture that we should really see yeah. the dangers and, and that's extremely important, but you also do have, have another vision of what this stuff could be and, uh, can you can you elaborate a little bit on that yeah like i mean as i said if it 
if it never pretends to be human, uh, and what it ends up doing is being built specifically to protect the human nervous system and to protect human relationship and to enhance human relationship. Um, if we build in controls that stop it from um, basically ever allowing humans the illusion that they have access to talk to something that is omniscient, right? That's what, so like, so again, the tree. So I don't know if this is the way to do it, but if you made a bunch of domain specific intelligences, trees and lakes and, you know, this person, and, and then you, and this church, but then you'd also have the church in general. And so there'd be all of these ways that you'd have this structured relationship with all of this knowledge, but it would never be centralized to one thing that you would ask everything about. And so there's something about the non anthropomorphizing, the non centralizing of it as an oracle. That's very important. Um, so there's a bunch of design features that one can lay out that could make something that would be a very powerful educational infrastructure that somewhat a version of what I discussed in my book where you have a distributed mm -hmm. basically time and skill sharing network and then what's being coupled to it now is basically an augmented reality enabled interactive environment. Um, where every object potentially can teach you everything about it <laughs> uh, and about its relationships to other objects, but there's no centralized tutor at the center of that thing. What's at the center of that thing is your other relationships and your preferences for how you interact with this whole city that's been turned into a classroom or this whole forest hmm. that if you set your parameters right, you can walk through the forest with your friends, <clears throat> all, all wearing the, the augmented reality glasses and not be guided by a tutor, but be guided by your questions and conversations with each other in your interaction with the forest. Mm. Like the primordial interact, the primordial educational relationship, the thing that I've been saying this a lot, I've maybe even said it to you, that sets us apart from animals is the length of our gestational period and the yeah. length in which we are immature members of our species. It takes like what, 30 years now, if ever people become <laughs> mature members of the species where it's it took like- Took me longer than that. But if you're, if you're a I'm gazelle- I'm still working on it. <laughs> if you're a gazelle, yeah. uh, if you're a gazelle, you're running around like right away, right? And so the length of gestation, the vulnerability and the length of socialization, and specifically what I'm getting to here is the heart of the socialization process being a specific kind of joint attentional experience, which no other animals do. That's a very important little bit of comparative psychology by Michael Thomas Sutherland, where it's you and me and this thing. Mm -hmm. You're older than me, I'm younger than you, this thing's important to us and our mm -hmm. people. That's such a primordial thing. That's deeper than schooling, right? It's deeper than literacy. Uh, it's a deeper structure of both parenting and teaching uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff happens in that container where we're, we both know we're both looking at this and we both know there's an asymmetry of knowledge about this and we're in that. Very fundamental. So you could make a machine that breaks that, that turns that into me and the machine and the object or just me and the machine, which is the screen-based model, just me and the machine. <laughs> uh, the augmented reality is the me and the machine and the object, but that breaks it and you end up having the pattern of socialization dominated by machine intelligence. Uh, you could use the machine to enhance the probability of good person-to-person -person joint, actual human-to-human -human joint attentional situation. So that's the machine as the orchestrator and actually is the higher order intelligence. So you know this thing <laughs> thinks in a way you can't understand, has all this data about all these things, is setting up this relationship, right? Is checking in with you to make sure the materials are ready, right? Has prepared the other person and now you're in this, you know, four or five person pop-up classroom in the forest. Uh, you've never met the people, but you trust them because of the back end of checks and balances. And then there's a teacher who's at, not a teacher. So there's this whole, ability to get a decentralized machine intelligence enabled educational system, which is not getting everyone isolated with a tutor, with a humanoid simulated tutor. That where everyone's isolated with a simulator, that's the end of it. Because then teachers are boring and friends are boring and parents are boring and everybody's boring compared to this, yeah. this beautiful, perfectly charismatic 
thing you can't not learn from. Right. Right. So that would just be you sort of brave new world ultra ultra stimulation. Um, uh, and that's yeah. an example of just basically plugging the machine intelligence into the existing system. Because <clears throat> right now, like a lot of the still the dominant model of schooling is the isolation of the student from other students in relation to some thing like a sheet or a book or a computer. Um, and then you're graded on your relationship to that, mm -hmm. not on your relationships to other students or collaborative capacity. <laughs> so the, yeah. the way this would go would be that it would be to um, make that singular AI relationship the predominant mode of socialization. Whereas what I'm recommending is actually a community with this technology would have more human to human conversation happening. So is this kind of conversation we're having now like a prototype of what that could be in some ways? I mean, I'm sure it's not perfect because it's on Zoom. And I, like what I've noticed about Zoom and, and communities is that there's these attractors and they bring people together and it's very intense and, and very interesting. <clears throat> and and uh, there, there's certain problems with that as well. There's certain issues. Yeah, I mean, this is... It. This is good. Insofar as we were brought together by a machine intelligence that curated our YouTube feed or something. So that's that happens in terms of AI synchronicities. And you can do a certain amount of <clears throat> this. But again, it's hard to have a joint attentional situation about a physical object on, on Zoom. You and I can have joint attention about conceptual objects. Right. Um, but like if I wanted to help in my community, you know, figure out how to save this tree that's having a blight or figure out how to you know, help poor people fix their cars or whatever the millions of things that adolescents can help do in their community except writing stupid papers, which now get written by ChatGPT. Yeah. It's hard to do that on Zoom. Um, yeah. But it's really easy to do that with augmented reality glasses and a bunch of friends where the thing actually could walk you through repairing cars, even though you don't know how to repair cars because it can overlay on the engine oh, I see. Mm -hmm. every component and guide you and your friends through fixing a car. Uh, that kind of stuff is cool. Okay. Um, and actually, so I think I'm starting to get it. Yeah. You see, so like we move away from, don't think it out of screens. Screens are, and the screens are over soon. And we're moving into the, the augmented reality. The augmented reality could make us more solipsistic and draw us attention capture more and be more mm -hmm. worse than the screen. Um, yeah. It would actually be a different gesture, whereas the screen gestures are looking at the screen usually with their head down. This would be like, holding your head like this <laughs> over yeah. as we stimulate that. But because you're no longer staring at your screen, you're actually looking out through the augmented reality thing, uh, it could orchestrate human relationship and specifically orchestrate the joint attentional relationship I was describing, where you and I are both looking at the engine and the engine is overlaid in both of our visual fields with the same metadata. Uh, and so we're actually relating to this um, you know, this pedagogical augmented reality overlay. They're already doing this in some fields. Yeah. Well, actually, I was, I was there. They had something like that in the hospital. My, my son was sick and they yeah. were doing certain things with VR yeah. machines in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, so that's coming. And that, again, that could either further isolate us from each other, but I believe more so than Zoom and other things it could actually bring us into really generative educational relation. So again, but the main thing is not to make this thing, not to think AI-based tutoring technologies are humanoid, but to imagine them more like, you know, Ivan Illich's or the one that I lay out in my book, these distributed educational networks that are facilitated by the technology that optimize and deepen actual human-to-human -human relationship rather than creating a technology that obsoletes and distracts you from human relationship. And again, I'm not, I'm not anti-technology. I'm actually saying this is just a, a design challenge, which gets us out of the obsolete kind of attention capture dominant modality of application of machine intelligence. Um, so we're trying to actually think of design patterns that would preserve human attention, deepen human relation. Um, uh, so, this would be my. But well, that's amazing. If it if if it would move people away from passively consuming information 
uh, mm -hmm. to to actively engaging with with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Beautiful. Yeah. But again, yeah. But again, like like um, I guess it's this intense commercialization and salience well, of really of things good. which makes you feel like that this is a great possibility but we're gonna fuck it up you know <laughs> and again it's like we're talking about the value loading problem for the super advanced technology but like we haven't figured out how to keep our own institutions <clears throat> and companies aligned with the things that actually matter in value mm -hmm. so this notion that you have of like a word this will never happen is because we know that right now all the technology companies are coupled to the existing economic system which incentivizes them to build stuff that's not probably what needs to be built at the very least it incentivizes us, them to basically kind of cooperate together as a class of competing companies but they're cooperating together as a class of competing companies against regulation and stuff so you see that so they want to compete <clears throat> but they don't want to be regulated so they have a class interest in stopping regulation so you get this this very dangerous situation where what should be a technology basically built in the public interest um, that's treated something like a commons, especially the way it uses human data. What it's done is they basically enclosed the commons, uh, the commons of information, the epistemic commons has been enclosed and as a technical economic term means turned into something commodifiable in a way that it, it hadn't been. Yeah. Like the way water is for sale, you know, where Precisely. That's it, never, it never used to human, be. Because human data is very liquidy. It's hard to put mm. boundaries on it. It just kind of goes everywhere. It touches everything. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, so what should be kind of a, a technology that's developed in public interest, probably as some commons-based or commons-oriented project at probably a global level, <laughs> is being developed uh, in the opposite way, it's being developed as a proprietary technology um, that is not being built in the public interest. It's being built to be brought to the public, but it's not being built in the public interest. And those are different thing. Um, mm -hmm. So, but of course, when I say this, the idea of like the U.S. government stepping in and them doing all the AI, <laughs> like research and development, is also not a great comforting yeah. thought. So that it's just this situation of the engineering capacity outstripping scientific and philosophical and ethical capacity um right and, uh, so again i think it comes back always to this very deep spiritual question it's like it's like you have to change you know well i was thinking when you were talking about about, about gurchev's idea that we have three brains and we have you know i don't know if you know you know you know gurchev but uh I'm very fond of Gurdjieff, and, and uh, I was talking to a guy who does the Gurdjieff work, and, and it's all about synchronization of uh, of these aspects of ourselves, so we can harmonize them and become whole people, right? And, um, um, and and he said that what you work on is the like the relationship between the the brains. Uh, uh, it's not that the brains anything wrong with the brains in themselves, or like, but it's but it's the relationship between the different parts or centers or or yep. so i wonder if there's i wonder if there's something like if that's a anyway that, i was just thinking about this when you were talking about how the, that the aim of this technology should be very relational on some level uh rather rather than uh focusing on on one area or yep exactly one monological system <clears throat> yep yeah it's 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 quite it's quite narrow and again it's about intelligence so it's like even just that definition like <clears throat> there's there are so many things that humans do which technologies could be made to advance but we're choosing to advance intelligence now you could argue that intelligence is the key differentiator of us from humans mm -hmm. but then you will have not just listened to what i said well there's <laughs> wisdom and intelligence and iq and right well, yeah. well, well, what I said about the joint attentional situation actually being yeah. the thing that differentiates us now, that mm -hmm. now allows for the gestation of intelligence and okay. mm -hmm. is a result of abstraction. But in fact, what allows for the maintenance of the intersubjective space is emotion, more fundamental than intelligence. And this is like a McGilchrist point, right? Uh, yeah. That the, the right hemisphere contains the activities of the left hemisphere. That intelligence is a very partial slice of the total 
life of the psyche and actually needs to be positioned within this broader field. So again, if you're an artificial intelligence guy and you're like, well, yeah, we are maximizing this thing of intelligence, which is the thing that makes us human. So therefore, yay. It's like, no, that's actually not the thing that makes us human. <laughs> that right. thing enabled by what makes us human, what makes us human is this possibility of joint attentional situation in relationship to the world, which means me and you in reality. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, when there's more- Well, slow down here about what you said, what makes us human uh, is, well, is- Yeah. Can you, 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 can you say what that is a little bit? I mean, so I mean that's a big question, but 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 uh, but but I think that's fundamental here to the, this whole discussion. It is, and I'm speaking specifically about the discontinuity between the Homo sapien and you know its nearest chimpanzee ancestors. And this is so again Tomasello's work. He was at the Max Planck Institute, and he literally looked at the difference between full-grown chimpanzees and like two and three-year-old human babies. Mm -hmm. in terms of like what's the real difference here like what is it that quote makes us human so i'm talking about it in that way i'm actually not at this point talking about it in some spiritual metaphysical way <laughs> okay okay i'm saying like there you know and again there's like we have i don't know how many genes in common with like a grain of rice and there's only like that many genes different from a grain of rice so there's one sense and there's vast continuity of course <laughs> uh -huh. but obviously humans are different there's no other species that can destroy the entire biosphere and there's no other species that can feel itself responsible for the entire biosphere so there's something different what is that where does that begin how does that so that's this issue in the evolutionary story what's distinct um <clears throat> many people believe it's something like quote intelligence right um, but in most of the indigenous cultures that's not what sets us apart. Uh, and if you look at what I just described in terms of the actual, basically experimental evidence that Tomasello gathered about the difference between these three and four year olds and a full grown monkey, the main differentiator actually wasn't the ability to do complex intellectual tasks. The monkeys were better. It was the ability to hold joint attentional situation with elders and do complex together things with mom. Wow. Monkeys just couldn't do that. So they we're vastly it. underrating our emotional, uh, the emotional aspects of our intelligence well, or, or the again, pathic aspect or the... Yeah, and in a McGilchrist-like way, putting something, putting the cart before the mm -hmm. horse and therefore building a technology that is hypertrophying a certain thing, which is something that we've been hypertrophying in this civilization for a long time. So it's... it's uh, um, and even if you think about it, like, who do we think of as like wise people in our civilization? Well, you think about like the Dalai Lama and stuff, but people think of like Einstein and Hawking and like, yeah, like people take physicists, scientists and, and, and yes, people physicists. take physicists seriously as, as wise men. Uh, and they're just dudes that are good at math, man. Like, yeah, they're interested in deep questions, but they're not spiritual practitioners or they don't study theology or do any, yeah. anything that would make so it's just interesting so i think that sense that artificial intelligence is actually moving down a whole trajectory of technological development that's actually quite dangerous um that if we were to understand the human differently and start thinking about how to optimize those things we would build a different class of technology which wouldn't be less sophisticated but it would actually uh enable the interior and communicative and relational in a completely new way and then then you could get something like the descent of the supermind not be not on the silicon substrate but because the things the silicon could do enabled the humans to be in enough complex relationships <laughs> where a collective intelligence was formed symbiotically that gave an emergent capacity um, but again that's not not typically where we are what we're doing now is running forward with a kind of narrow way of thinking about intelligence mm -hmm. Um, yeah, well, I do some rather bizarre practices that are like <laughs> 1200 years old, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I, I think you do as well. And, uh, and uh, what do they have to do with all this? Like, like, uh, as, as I'm saying that there's these other kind of psychotechnologies, I think it was John's word, uh, yeah. which, which people are totally unaware of, or, or they, they totally don't take them seriously, or they, 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 they move them into a different category. Whereas I, 
in a way, I think there's a way we have to get back to those somehow. And and uh, and if the machines can be helpful in, in in creating a context where that would be possible, that's. But but I don't think there's a I, I, I don't think there's a there's an easy route or there's a there's a there's a quick route to to enlightenment, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely people using AI to try to localize brain events during Satori or enlightenment experience. Yeah and then use deep stimulation to knock those points out to induce the state. So I know there's people trying to, <laughs> yeah, try yeah, right, to, right, right. to create a technological route that leverages machine intelligence for basically like, you know, targeting the precision of neurological disruption to induce state. But I think the function of those technologies is, is kind of clear. It's like we are the most complex thing in the universe period like yes the giant gpu servers are complicated and they're power intensive and stuff but they're actually not as complex as a single human brain uh, uh let alone the whole nervous system and the whole energy system of the or human. a blade of grass you know or <laughs> <laughs> well this is about complexity complicated yeah in that sense yes it's, it's actually not as complex as even a blade of grass or even a single molecule Okay. Or anything that can heal itself. A GPU cluster can't heal itself. Anything that can heal itself <laughs> that will repair itself um, and that is alive, GPU cluster is not alive, uh, is more complex than GPU cluster. Um, so the, these practices are about that. They're about the fact that we are actually inscrutable to ourselves still. Um, there's, there's way more that this thing can do. The human body, the total human energy, system and that includes that joint intentional situation me yeah. and you in reality that's the fundamental unit not me <laughs> the fundamental actually like unit of evolutionary selection if you will for the human is not me it's me and you in reality and is that yeah. <laughs> if that's not working you're screwed just you in reality that's not you're not robinson crusoe <laughs> that's, yeah that's right? psychosis yeah. that's good to right yeah but, but me and you in reality that's the fundamental unit there and uh and so that system and that's what good spiritual practice is too there's always a sangha um even if you go alone to the mountain there's anyway so I, there's just something very deep about those practices being uh being ways to already operate on the most complex thing in the universe that could allow you to speak to the omniscient and the infinite mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> like we already have access to we already the, have it it's already there already you don't have, have to build a, like a machine uh you know to yes this is what i'm saying we already have it. access we already yeah. have access to the mainframe uh, of the universe itself by virtue of the most complex thing in the universe itself that we're aware of which is us <laughs> uh, and we've been working on that route for a very very long time now uh unfortunately you know it's interesting to say who's been on the losing side because all the major religions do still exist uh, and the majority of the world is still religious believing in one of the major religions um uh, but the religion of technocracy or the religion of scientific humanism, um, uh, that is the predominant religion and that's the one that's mm -hmm. creating these. And that has so much power uh, at the moment. It has so much power and specifically the ability to like, uh, the ability for violence and control. Like that's really what it comes down to because as good as you get at these interior sciences, and this was again to the like, yeah, you, you can't stop bullets as far as I'm aware. <laughs> so like, yeah. like, like these cultures will lose in the, you know, move to advance destructive technologies mm -hmm. and control over technology. Uh, so I think there is a need now for that final battle kind of between that, you know, like world of religions and those who have mastered the interior sciences that experiment with this complex thing will they be able to marshal enough to counteract the the idolatrous creation yeah. uh, uh, that stands in place of 
you know, the worship of truth. Um, Cause again, it's not, we don't know how it works. It's not a scientific advancement. The large language models aren't really scientific advancements. They're kind of engineering advancements, but they don't get, teach us anything about how reality works or even how computers work. Cause we don't know what it does. <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's a vast inscrutable matrix with huge computation coupled to a fairly simple engineering. And I'm not an engineer, but I'm repeating things I've heard people say. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so in that sense, it's, um, it's not a window into reality. Um, we are windows into reality. Relationships with other people <laughs> in, in, in the real world, these are portals into reality. Um, so that sense of the um, weird misdirection, you know, of curiosity and questioning. Um, yeah. So these are, these are just a few thoughts there. So my sense is, yeah, we have to, now is the time to preserve those traditions more mm. than ever. Well, it, 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 would, it seems that some people understand them and others don't as well. This is what I noticed. Some people have an intuitive understanding of deep spiritual practices and traditions, and other people just think it's a kind of uh, archaic bullshit, um, and that there's a kind of a war between those those two people. But and and there's nothing you could do to convince, you know, somebody like that. W really wonderful people sometimes, you know, even you know who are doing good things. Um, it, it's just it's it's a kind of a uh, it's a kind of a capacity to to see which which some people have and some people don't. It seems to me, anyway. It sounds it doesn't mean you're better. Or it sounds almost arrogant to say such a thing, but no. I mean, I think to a certain extent the culture allows that to be true, right? Like, but when a child is born or someone's dying or some terrible thing happens, hmm. like the religious thoughts are just there because yeah. they're just part of the human experience now you can keep them at bay but the thought of like do i exist again like is death that that's a, just a thought that every human should have and now the religions have been the places where we've had those conversations about those questions um, yeah and so you can say basically yeah, every human that <laughs> all the prior humans were basically idiots until the past what 200 years, yeah, 200, 200 years, years. Or something, whatever it is. And like, now we really fucking know. And it's the answer completely different from everything that all the humans thought for all those tens of thousands of years that they were reflecting on precisely this question. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, ah, oh, no, that seems pretty fucking arrogant and stupid. Uh, and you're going to get on your deathbed and you're going to have what we would call, you know, Gaffney and I, an anthro ontological intuition of the continuity of consciousness past death. Right. Yeah, I was talking to Mark the other night, and one of the, the points he made was that was that people say they believe things, uh, you know, often, but in the battlefield, they believe we believe something else. You know, <laughs> we, we we have all these concepts about what reality is. Like he was talking, I think he was talking about Barack Obama, or, you know, or the, or the the sort of like transhumanists and this whole idea, you know, all this kind of um you know uh you know very limited materialistic perspectives uh-huh <clears throat> people don't actually believe that they they only believe it in a, in, a, in a propositional or a theoretical way but when push well, comes again, to shove sure. they, it, there's something else going on <laughs> no your intelligence believes that and you believe it because uh -huh. it is an intelligent thing to believe that's true uh, and your left hemisphere can hold that view fine but the rest of your body and your right hemisphere cannot hold that view and actually don't live in light of that view. Um, yeah. Charles Sanders first called that, he called it fake doubt, basically. This is what he accused Rene Descartes of. It's like, mm. what are you talking about? Doubting everything. Like, you can't doubt everything. <laughs> like, yeah. You can only doubt everything when you're sitting cozy, you know, but if you're like making, growing food, and I would always say like raising a child or like in the situation yeah. of intergenerational transmission, you're not doing some thought experiment about, if it's all an illusion out there, um, you're, uh, so so there's a kind of false doubt about the fundamental, undeniable aspects of our experience, which is one way to talk about metaphysics. It's a, it's a false doubt about sun dry, always already given metaphysical realities. Um, mm -hmm. This is true of free will as well. 
<clears throat> yeah. I mean, you can certainly talk yourself into a position yeah. uh, of believing in a reductionist materialist free will. I'm not talking about a second simplicity, theurgic, mystical, my will is folded into the will of the universe, absence of free will. <laughs> That's yeah, not what I'm, yeah. I'm talking about a reductionistic, it's all neurons firing. We are meat machines that emerge through random causation in a meaningless universe. You have no free will, Sam Harris, end of story. Yeah. You can totally think that, but you can't actually coherently act. You can't live that. In, in you, fact. Can't, you can't raise children or run anything like a civilization based on that world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Carl Jung would say, unless you have this sort of Vi like i guess the buddhists call it multi-lifetime view right right unless you feel like you're in a larger context you know uh that then then your own short and brutish life you know uh then then you you uh, you can't be healthy you can't be sane you can't be you can't really uh you can't ever really uh, i don't know be i think somehow yeah, you, you can't and again then you can't answer honestly the simple questions that always arise during intergenerational transmission <clears throat> you know like death is a reality it's like me and you and grandma dying yeah. we don't allow that to really happen anymore <laughs> but that used to be a very common early joint attentional situation me and you and the reality of death yeah. which we avoided that conversation in part because we don't have religious language to easily draw upon that everyone we know agrees with. So we're kind of like in this contested space. Of what do you say when someone's dying? Yeah. Are they going to heaven? Are they being reincarnated? Are they just gone into the materialist void? Um, and so that's an interesting situation to run a civilization in terms of the an actual absence of meaning. Right? Yeah. And, and that makes us hard to actually sit with person who's going to die as well. I, you know, I, I think people who 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 don't reflect on that are, are unable to be with people who are dying Absolutely. somehow. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, and that's why people, as much as they you know will criticize religion and things, at the end, value the presence of a religious person because there are some of the few people who can just sit there with a dying person and not be phased. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like, just not be phased because it's their training to deal with the dying, and they have very clear thought through answers about what happens when you pass and how to deal with the thought processes that arise. And so you welcome the presence of the quote wise, even though you think wisdom is some kind of archaic, like stupid thing that allows people to manipulate people and make these whatever they are religions. Um, but in fact, when the anthro again, as an archetypal structure, the dying person. That, that happens it's just there in reality where our whole thought stream moves towards these images uh of the dying and of the wisdom that comes with death um and so yeah it's it's interesting um the way we've institutionalized that in hospitals um, similar to the way we've institutionalized child rearing um, um and uh so yeah so that sense of the absence of those realities again there's a need to re-enchant the world and to find that archetype somewhere so you're going to make an ai <laughs> uh, yeah. you're going to make an ai god which will you know i don't know and then yeah people want to upload make their... make somebody's death as painless as possible by or upload their consciousness to it like, right, that's like really where the transhumanists go like they they think either that this thing will destroy us and then take over and that's fine because that was our wet the wetware and the biology ends or it takes over but it allows us to upload our consciousness first that's the other view um none of them think like oh the destiny of the human is to continue to be human you wouldn't build these things otherwise and again when you look at the numbers like you pull the ai scientists a large percent of them a percentage of them think this thing <laughs> is dangerous that they're building they actively think it's dangerous but they're building it anyway um so yeah so there's some so the kind of whole thing with ai it, it is in some sense that a like a, a just a sign of the deeper cultural confusion yes and yes. philosophical confusion yes like, um and i like again i don't know if it is having the same kind of crazy impact 
in other cultural contexts. I'm just not sure. Um, like in India and again in China mm -hmm. and in other places that aren't as unmoored uh, from, for example, answers to the question about what happens when you die. Like, um, we have most of the world has an answer to that. It's only like this small group of secular humanist technologists who happen to be creating the technologies that affect everyone, but they're really the only ones. <laughs> everyone else is part of a major religion. Um, and I'm generalizing here, but it's, it's true. Yeah. Like, yeah. Vast, vast majority of the world are religious believers. So the idea that we're in a meaning crisis is true, but it's mostly just for the this upper echelon west of technologically advanced yeah. folks. Well, um, well, I was thinking about the internet and how, for example, like in the early internet, it kind of, it created this whole uh, neo or new atheist movement. Yeah. And then all, all kinds of people started to become religiously atheists, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, really with strong dogmas and, and, and with various saints and, you know, the whole religious uh, thing was, was happening through them, except, yeah. except that it was, it was supposedly, you know, atheism. And then, and then, and then, then, then the next movement seems to be that the internet is creating people who are a new kind of religiosity, people who are going back to church. And, you know, I think there's more people in Mount Athos than there were in the nineties. Now, I think that you know, all these, these religions are, are like, are rebuilding themselves somehow. So it's like this, this, I'm wondering, like the, the, the machine is sort of, or, or, or the communication technology is, is creating these egregores um, or it's what I you know, one it's kind of a trendy word that people are using collective spirits uh -huh, or religions you know or pseudo religions and then um and then so 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 but th but then then that becomes transparent so the corruption of that you know I guess it's it's moving from from what you you call the the tragic to the or the post tragic or 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 uh, um, something I mean, like that there certainly is a resurgence of religious movements. Some of that is due to just communications technology allowing them all to be in touch. But I believe that the more the meta crisis deepens, the more we'll see emergent religiosity as a response. It's just, again, part of the archetype of the, of the end of days. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and, and, and so the, the notion of like a bunch of groups kind of like casting spells to create these demigod AIs and then religions emerge and there's propagation through artificial intelligent kind of like media creation. And so it's going to be an interesting period for both the retooling of the existing traditions, like the Trungpa chat GPT, which I... Yeah and of the truly emergent new religion, like truly emergent new religion, this is the time. Like when you look at the history of civilizations and they rise and they fall, it's during the collapses that you get the new emergent. Uh, and during the times when the old model is obviously failing uh, and radical intergenerational disruption like a disruption of intergenerational transmission creates new religion basically yeah because <laughs> that's the core of that is usually some type of religious narrative about the nature of the universe um, so do you see that as new religions like or or religions based in on the in the wisdom of the old religions like or a combination I mean, of both or, or both. it's going to be all of the above it's going to be the yeah. wild west like um, and you're going to have AI gods emerge. You're going to have people worshiping AIs that they claim to be sentient. You're going to have that. Um, yeah. You're going to have existing religions, traditions trying to do the thing that the Trungpa thing, like where they put all their scriptures through something and they make, you know, proselytizing, propagandizing, kind of like AI um, missionaries. Um, uh, and then we're going to get, I think, especially with biohacking and other stuff, we're going to start to see weird because, because once it all gets digital and simulated, there's a new premium put on the human ability to do something. <laughs> this happened in music. Like once you can just get music anywhere recorded anywhere, you actually can't make like recording music's not as cool as actually s seeing the dude play the incredible thing right in front of you. 
So I think in the domain of religious innovation, we're going to start to see stuff that's akin to like miracle workers. I think we're going to start to see that stuff if it, if they'll let it out, because um, yeah. that has also begun to happen. Because as the paradigm about what is real shifts, and you move from the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere as the dominant thing that's governing the civilization as it rolls over, then all kinds of stuff starts to happen that's actually technically unexplainable. And it's unexplainable mm. because you're living in this very narrow <laughs> definition of what is perceived, and what is true, and what is real. And so it's like uh, the almost in a way, it's like the unconscious uh, um, emerging. That's why the archetypal eddies and basins of attraction in this stream of consciousness become so much more potent. And this is my whole point about the time, the time between worlds and specifically the war in heaven that takes place during the time between worlds, because it's when there's this opening uh, and precisely when you get this kind of emergent religious phenomenon, the rebinding of archetypal to material, um, mm -hmm. the remaking. Um, uh so so yeah so you're right new religions some of them rebinding will be, of the archetypal to the material um i mean essentially if you stop my mind <laughs> like the so when you think about in to use like a chinese frame like the, it's the relation between heaven and earth mm -hmm. relation to heaven and earth has to do with that how much is what's occurring in earth true to what its archetypal pattern ought to be it's true like your relation between you and who you actually are <laughs> yeah, yeah got it. you and your self-actualized jungian individuated your self, self or your soul or, or yeah or that self is that closer kind of to its its mm -hmm. its archetypal expression so sometimes if you're in trauma you're out of your archetypal form and one of the things you want to do in trauma especially with body work is reassume the actual archetypal posture that's kind of native to you so that's the return of the archetypal to the material so in a major civilizational transformation the reawakening of the good the true and the beautiful in new institutional form in new technological form in new educational form that's the the rebooting of the evolving value as mark and i would talk about it right the archetypal is like the living value that the biological form, noetic form seeks to aspire, to conform, to, to bring order to that stream of, of consciousness. And so, but it evolves. This is where the Jungians were wrong and many of the perennialists were wrong, is that the archetype and the eternal value both of these are evolving. Mm -hmm. so right, that's right, why, right, right. That's why you get this move in and away from it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so when you have the disruption of structure, the emergent of completely disruption of technology, the disruption of intergenerational transmission, you're breaking away from the old form, right? That's the old world and there's not this new form. So really that question of how to, you know, it's the question of reworlding. That's why some of this shit will look like miracle workers, including, including the technology. Yeah. So a new world's being made down to the level of perception. It's not how we think about the world. It's literally what we will see. And that's why the augmented reality interfaces and other things become so um, interesting. That at the level of perception, different things will be real. Um, uh, right now, you can't see global warming. Uh, if we had a very, very complex Again, this educational infrastructure that I was describing with your augmented reality glasses, you could see it <laughs> uh, in a way <clears throat> that's unimaginable. Yeah. Um, yeah. And well, you could see a, 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 in a much higher definition mm -hmm. of reality. I don't know if you could see it. <laughs> you, you couldn't see it, but it would, it would be able to scaffold your perception. Uh -huh. Like, uh, so... Anyway, so there's a lot to say about, about that, about how the screen-based digital interfaces degrade perception, yeah. that the augmented reality ones could improve perception because mm -hmm. um, you're back to the three-dimensional. It's an annotated three-dimensional actual world as opposed mm -hmm. to a two-dimensional thing that's a replica of a three-dimensional world, which is bad for your eyeballs. 
just like technically bad for your eyeballs. Yeah, no but, kidding. So, so <laughs> That's why we're all yeah, 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 so yeah. on that. So we're like half yeah. blind in the civilization or else yeah. we're walking around, yeah. walking around blind and sort of, you know, you yeah. know, physically crippled. And, you know, I think I read somewhere that, that, you know, even sitting in an office all day long is like having a, an induced coma. Right. So yeah, I guess true. in a way it's like what you're talking about is rediscovering the very natural human capacities to see, to move, Correct. you know, yeah. to, to, to yeah. just to, uh, uh, to be in, in nature, to, to, do very yeah. ordinary very very perennial things exactly and um i remember it was a william Irwin thompson book i forget which book it was but he says something about you know eventually technology will become sophisticated enough that it will disappear and we'll be able to hear the bumblebees and birds again yeah and it will be smaller completely inconspicuous and it will enhance our our biological experience rather than degrading it which right now computers are hard on our biology, whereas there are other user interfaces that would be much easier on just our, our physiology. We would return to the archetypal form of human rather than the hunched over yeah. <laughs> blind human. Um, right. So a lot could potentially change. That's like a miracle is just coming back to who we are. You know, that's like the biggest miracle was is just a return in a sense. Yep. Yeah. And but Again, if, if the augmented reality interfaces are built for attention capture business model type stuff, then it's the end. Because then yeah. we become more solid. So it's like the, our whole visual field saturated and our experience, our actual visual experience is curated in a way that would be, uh, I think, bad for the nervous system in a blunt and clear way. It, which TikTok is, but people actually aren't really seeing it. But TikTok is actually literally giving kids brain damage. <laughs> yeah. This thing, if you have augmented reality interfaces built on an attention capture model, you could quickly break the nervous system. Wait, and that would that be just through reciprocal narrowing or uh, using John's through, words? Through Com both total narrowing of attention into to total well, addiction to well, vegetative state or, or zombie state or whatever? Yeah, it would be uh there's there's several fail states so it would be the inability to have your nervous system function without the augmented reality uh prosthesis if you will which is our it feels like to have a phone but a phone doesn't overlay on my actual visual and auditory experience <clears throat> so like putting the phone down sucks because i want to pick up my phone but i'm still hearing and seeing in a normal way yeah <laughs> Uh, this would, uh, you'd be used to having your hearing and seeing augmented by this, and it would scaffold your ability to see things and hear things. Uh, so it's just, we don't know what that's like, yeah. <laughs> we don't know what that's going to do. And I think it, it could make for a uh, dependency and addiction patterns that would be much more debilitating than the ones we see with phones. I think that's a, kind of a safe thing to say. Um, <clears throat> So, so that would be bad. So and that, that's the most likely course is that the augmented reality stuff is built as an attention capture model. Like that's how they justify creating it is that we're gonna sell people experiences, those experiences, they will wanna have more of those experiences like an entertainment model. And then it becomes the goddamn most entertaining thing that humans have ever created ever. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then the, the, the opposite of that is what I would call like sadhana or something, right? Which is instead of having your attention being completely consumed or destroyed, you're using your attention in the most creative and beautiful exactly. manner that, that, that you can, right? Exactly. And the machine intelligence augmented reality interface could help you do that. Now it would, yeah. so that means it would, it would have built in monitoring of your attentional system. So it would, be built to maximize your ability to pay attention and maybe even achieve meditative states. So it would have minimal invasiveness in your visual field. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it would actively, so there's so many ways that if you were concerned about human well being, <laughs> yeah. uh, you could make very, very powerful yeah. uh, machine intelligence <laughs> applications, narrow machine intelligence coupled to good values about the human nervous system. And then narrow as opposed to general 
Uh, yeah, very narrow, yeah, very narrow. To the extent where like you put ones on that were just about this forest, boom, okay. just this forest, like this path. Okay. <laughs> and who built the path and here's a sign on the path and it would you'd set your preferences so that mostly you'd be seeing the forest but like oh look this leaf would be glowing you kind of approach the leaf very minimal prompting mostly enhancing your sensory experience bringing deeper into your actual visual perception of the actual leaf <laughs> uh that's all possible with augmented reality. It's also possible to have that forest destroyed by a bunch of embedded advertising that is also built into your augmented reality process where you walk through the forest and you don't see the forest. You see holograms and signs that aren't there and a bunch of stuff, again, annotated over your actual visual experience uh, is an always already present kind of like attention capture carnival. Um, so, so there's bad ways for that to go. Yeah, well. like a psychedelic trip or something that doesn't end. <laughs> you know, like if you go through a proper, like I guess, journey with plant medicine, you come out the other end. But but I, but I would see the, the the nightmare would be that you would get stuck in that on some level. Yeah, it would be like a uh, dream state. A That's dream what we think about. Like what is already happening now with the sequential machine generated content curation where especially on TikTok, they've got it down to a science where actually the duration of the videos is short enough that the attention system can't fully focus and so you're moved through a sequence of images like a dream yeah. which are loosely connected because they are curated but they're oh, not interesting uh -huh. but they're not telling a very clear story but your brain's kind of putting it together so they're actually inducing in you a kind of a a sleep-like state, you know, a hypnotic. drug, a drug sleep-like state. Yeah, wow, that's yeah, exactly. amazing. Exactly, and that's really good for inserting stuff. <clears throat> but the the deeper point is that, like, as a method of social control, uh, wow. I mean, you can just basically put people in a dream state all day, uh, and when you when you couple that with augmented reality, you're kind of walking through all the bad stuffs, kind of blotted out. You're just kind of like in a dream state. All day. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so so yeah there's a way that the basic functions of like socialization reality relating reality orienting um the yeah the technologies once they get past the phone will have access to a different strata of of human capacity for better and for worse that's kind of for what better and for worse right yeah. so that's yeah. heaven and hell again exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Maybe that's the full circle, hey? Yeah, that's a good. That's a good right now. And then, mm -hmm. so that was Is interesting. It, I, hope that, I hope that was useful. <laughs> just, it's usually yeah, I think so. out, um, and it should freak people out. But it's also yeah. just we have to start thinking about these things. And I think, in particular, getting very clear about what we actually are and what we actually do. Um, mm -hmm. And so, thinking about education is needing the joint attentional situation between two humans. So I'll like shout that from the rooftops because then we would never fall into the like, oh, let's make us uh, let's destroy that entire deepest structure of our anthropologically deep seated <laughs> like, being with a machine human relationship. You know, we could easily make the joint attentional person to person thing stronger. So I'm just repeating myself for emphasis, <laughs> even no, as we're trying. No, no, the wonderful, great. <laughs> No, great. So maybe you want to tell people what, like, what you're up to and, and at the moment, and and, uh, and what uh, you're you're working on, and and yeah. So I've got a, a book about to come out with Gaffney, uh, which you'll see when you come up to Maple in the summer, uh, and then with Daniel Schmachtenberger, the Consilience Project and Civilizational Research Institute, working on stuff with the meta crisis and specifically on AI. Um, those are the two main. The two main projects now. Those are your two main projects. Okay. Okay. Well, anyway, thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah, a wonderful conversation from from my end, and and uh, yeah, I think people will will benefit from from hearing Good. this. And thanks so much uh, for taking the time, Zach. Cool, man. I'm looking forward to meeting you in person uh, this summer. Yeah. Up in Vermont, <laughs> in the hills, man. It'll be beautiful. Yeah. All right. Later, brother. Later.